buenos dias. How's it going? My name is Jacob Stiefel. Welcome to the Don't Stifle Me podcast, where I have the privilege of getting to sit down with guests from all across music and performing arts, and we discuss how they got to where they are, the challenges, ups and downs of chasing something that you're passionate about in life, and anything else that comes up along the way. So if you've never listened to the podcast before, then welcome. If you enjoy this talk and were any of the other ones and you want more, you just can't can't get enough. Well, they'll make sure you, first of all, click subscribe, but also uh, go over and check out www.patreon.com slash DSM podcast over there for as little as a dollar or three dollars a month. You can get access to exclusive behind the scenes pictures and video from here at the podcast and also some MP3 downloads of songs that I jam on with guests on various episodes. So once again, if you want to check that out, awesome. It's www.patreon.com slash DSM podcast. All right. And the guest chair today is my old friend, Cassidy Feesby. Cassidy plays bass for Dirks Bentley, a country artist, if you're not aware. And I learned that Cassidy has also starred in several of Dirks' music videos through the years. I personally recommend the uh, Somewhere on a Beach video which i put in the show notes page because cassidy at one point he plays a lifeguard and at one point he strips off down to some little shorty shorts and and runs down the beach in slow motion so go check that out anyway i met cassidy back in my downtown nashville days when i used to play some of the bars on broadway six or eight years ago and he's he's always been one of my favorites that i've met through the years and i'm really glad we got to sit down and catch up and we discuss going from high school band to his first cover bands, moving to Nashville, and how he ultimately ended up getting the job playing bass for Dirk Spentley, and a whole lot more. So check it out. Here is my conversation with Cassidy Feesby. Pick it up the piano. Cassidy Feesby, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, children of all ages. How's it going, man? Hello, Jacob. Is it is it cold out there? Yeah, it's not as cold <clears throat> as yesterday, but January 2018 is... Whew, it's a cold one so far. Oh, I was, uh, we were talking, see, so we're, we're recording this on the 3rd, and yesterday on the 2nd, I got up and it was 9 degrees outside, wind chill of negative 2. We don't do that here. <clears throat> I'm hurting, like inside, just, just thinking about that. That's not good. How was your How was your Christmas, New Year's? It was good. Good family on, family stuff. Yeah, family stuff. Went on a family trip, and everybody arrived safe and sound back at home and ready for the new year. Yeah, no shows, no no New oh, Year's Eve show or anything. Uh, not New Year's Eve show. I haven't done a New Year's Eve show in like four or five years. Yeah, it's unbelievable. <clears throat> I'm okay with that. Like, you know, for a while there, it was like, oh, I got to get a big New Year's Eve show. Yeah, yeah. and then now I'm like. Can I just sit at home on it's New Year's fine. Eve on my couch? And you know what? I, I sat here on my couch, ate uh, half of a special brownie, um, <clears throat> drank some wine, and watched the new Dave Chappelle comedy special on Netflix. Okay. That was my New Year's Eve, and it was phenomenal. We bounced around in East Nashville to a couple friends' parties and then had some friends over for New Year's Day, just like hang, play board games, yeah. and eat food all day long. And we're like, Maybe we should just stay in for now on on New Year's Eve, yeah, and then do like a New Year's Day recovery party for everybody else. That's a good idea. I like that. I talked to a, a friend of mine, you know, Don Gallardo. Mm-hmm. You know, <clears throat> we were talking about Christmas Christmas plans, and he was saying, I think they do his wife's his wife's family Christmas like two weeks before Christmas, and his family Christmas like two weeks after Christmas. So, uh-huh. so his Christmas, he said, it's great. On Christmas Day, we get up and open presents, and then we just sit around at the house all day. Don't leave. Never change out of our pajamas, and my wife and I drink. That's a legit day off <laughs> that's right like, there. That's awesome. That's a, that's a great Christmas. When do you go back out again? When you, um, We just did dirks. two nights in Vegas, uh, December like 16th and 17th, and then uh, we're going to L.A. for some TV stuff January 17th and 18th again. For those people that uh, chose not to read the description of this podcast, hello. Uh, would you like to tell them who you are and what you do? Uh, my name, like Jacob said, is uh, Cassidy Feesby, and I play bass with Dirk Bentley 
four, going on eight years. It's a long time. It's, it's a long time to do anything. Yeah. Let alone be in a enclosed area with with a group of people. Yeah. That, over, that, and over, that, and over and over and over and over. That's again. a huge part of like. That's one big lesson that I've learned in my tenure in Nashville, which is, which this past August was eighteen years. It's like you've got to be able to hang. You obviously yeah. have to be able to play whatever that means to that specific gig, but it's like yeah. the hang is eighty five percent of it. Just be cool. Yeah, that's, that, that, that's what it boils down to. Yeah, you know, be good at your instrument, but other than that, just be cool. That's one thing that you learn. From other people, as you and when you're playing with different bands or when you have different band guys, if you're the artist, it's like you're around great people and you can take the use them as an example of like how to treat other people. Yeah. And then you see just outright douchebags that are just rampaging through life. Great it's examples like, of how not to treat yes, people. Yeah. For sure. Yeah. I've seen people so many times. I'm like, all right, if I ever get to that point, that is not how I'm going yeah. to act. It's like you need to have somebody in your life <clears throat> to keep you in check. That will kick you. And yeah, for like sure. Bring you back. Bring you back around. For sure. Where are you from? Uh, originally from Convoy, Ohio, Northwest. Convoy. It reminds me of that old uh, CW, CB, CB C, radio song. The C, C, CW McCall. I think. Yeah, 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 yeah. Got ourselves a convoy. Oh, that's a good one. Yeah, convoy. We got a great big convoy. <laughs> Those background vocals on that are amazing. Yeah. This is a rubber ducky. I got the don't you know, big ten four. <laughs> Come on, back, good buddy. <laughs> Convoy, Ohio, is that what you said? Yes. O-H-I-O. What mm-hmm. part of the state is that? Um, it's no- Uber <clears throat> Northwest, like 10 miles from the Indiana line and okay. an hour from Michigan. Fort Wayne, Indiana is where we'd go for legit civilization. Oh, the big city? <laughs> yeah. Our, ours was uh, was Chattanooga. Chattanooga or... Oh, north. Yeah. Because we're... Fort Payne was just right at the Georgia and Tennessee state lines, kind of, in the very corner. So you could get to... Really, Birmingham, Huntsville, about the same amount of time, or Chattanooga was a little bit closer. But if you just wanted to go to the shitty mall, you could go to Gadsden. No, no offense, Gadsden, Alabama. <laughs> but that was the, like, I just need to go get some CDs. Were there any, like, uh, state laws where, you, like, you couldn't get something in Alabama, but you'd cross over the Tennessee line? Oh, yeah. Uh, well, it was, Georgia was a closer than Tennessee. So, I mean, my parents right now live four minutes from Georgia, like, right there on the line. And... Yeah, growing up, the county I grew up in was dry. So mm. if you wanted, if you know, if my dad or somebody wanted to buy alcohol, or if me and some of my buddies wanted to go do what we called pulling a hey you <laughs> yeah. at, at a gas station, we'd have to go either across the state line or to another county, but the state line was closer. Also, I remember in high school <laughs> um, to in Alabama to buy tobacco, you had to be 19. But in Georgia, you only had to be 18 hmm. or it was 18 and 17, one or the other, uh, one or the other to the point to where at some point we could, some of us could go across to Georgia and buy it, but couldn't buy it. No, oh, it's crazy, crazy rules. And, and you don't have to have a license to have kids. <laughs> it makes yeah, complete crazy. sense. There's world. people out there, there's people out there voting and, and breeding and driving. It's crazy. It's, it's, loony, loony it's all unchecked. How did you have a brothers and sisters? Tell us about the, the Cassidy Feesby home life. Uh, I have one up. brother that is the complete opposite of myself. Yeah. Uh, blonde hair, blue eyes. <clears throat> and uh, he's two years younger than I am. Um, Hitler would have loved him. Uh, okay. <laughs> All right. Uh, and my parents, <laughs> we lived in a, uh, in a house like on the corner from where my parents' house is now that burned down when I was five and my brother was three. And then uh, we moved into the house that my grandparents built right next to it. And my parents still live in that house. And my brother lives about 2,000 feet across the intersection. Oh, that's nice. So it's like the family plot, Point. kind of. Yep. Yeah. <clears throat> Everybody's- my family's kind of like that. It's got like my granny's by the road. Mom and dad are just up on top of the hill. And then my sister's like a mile and a half away down the street. And then I'm up here. Hey. Like our five year plan here in Nashville is to well, maybe it's a three year plan. We've been talking about it for two years. Is to get like a you know, like ten acres or something out in northwest Nashville and then yeah. have some family move down. We live on one corner of the land and they live on the other, so oh, yeah. it's like built in babysitting a little bit, but you still have like a support What's system. Their, what are their thoughts on that? Are they are they in uh, on some that? of them are in. Yeah. Yeah. Just gotta some of them are completely out. Use those that are in to you know, influence the ones that are yeah. maybe not. We don't want to overpopulate the land. <laughs> I don't need too many. Is it? Would that be the the Feesby 
family or would it be like your mom's side and mom or dad's side of the family? Um, it's like some in-laws. I'm still working on my parents. Yeah. I don't yeah. I don't know how that's going to go down. <laughs> cool. So, uh, where'd you go to high school? What's the name of your high school and mascot? Um, the Crestview Knights. Crestview Knights. And that's oh. one of the serendipitous things about, about the that? hot country nights. Yeah. The, the real fake nineties country band that the Dirks band started. Ladies and gentlemen, whatever you get out of this podcast, Make sure you go. Are there, there's YouTube videos and stuff, yeah, right? Yeah, there's YouTube oh, yes. videos. Go look up the Hot Country Nights and spell nights with a K, and you'll thank you'll thank me later. Hotcountrynights.com is a there good place go. to start. Yeah. <clears throat> Trevor Travis is a, is a, my personal favorite. This picture you have up on the screen is uh, <laughs> it's great. That some, may be my permanent back background on my computer now. It's, it's kind of mean and kind of disgusting all at the same time. Mustaches. It's like at the same time you're saying, "Did I just do that?" Yeah, I just did that. That's what that face is. I'm like, mm. yeah, it's <laughs> unbelievable. That's two years ago. The uh, the Knights was your high school. Yes, cool. Well, did you play sports? Were you in the band? Um, I was there? the band, the Uber band, nerd. music music like gal show boy. choir, concert band, marching band. You know, it's unfortunate that that band people however you want to refer to them get such a bad rep at least in like small towns i know in Mm -hmm. small town you know where i grew up they were not the cool kids the quote-unquote cool kids but there's so much of an emphasis on on sports yeah and i don't know why it's not a good or bad thing but yeah why is that so much i mean i think it probably boils back to i guess war and battle why sports are so prevalent or something, mm-hmm. but, but like the coolest people now, you know, in adulthood that I know we're like band geeks and band nerds and band people. And I mean, I played football. I can't, I'm, I'm, I'm talking about this from an onlooker's point of view, but, uh, but yeah, I feel like they're even the, the should be the cooler kids because they learned at an earlier age, this is who I am where the people like it or not. This is just who I'm going to have to be. Yeah, you know, I feel that's, like that's something. You know, I've just learned in the last five, six years. Well, in, in like the culture of my high school, like the basketball team, the baseball team, the softball teams were like going to state championships every year. So yeah. there was like a culture of like we're kicking ass, right? And so, and our band did well at times, but it just wasn't a focus because we weren't crushing it. Yeah, like everyone else. Seemed what to uh? What era were you, what years were you in like junior high and high school and stuff? What years were those? Um, that would have been like, I was 13 and 94. So like 93, 94, 95. Cause I was, I was talking to my dad the other day and I love my dad. He's always, uh, very, I don't want to say quick, but he doesn't mind giving me criticism. That's on, good. On, it's, it's great. Yeah, it's, it's open it's communication. Open it's a beautiful, communication. wonderful thing. And I would not trade it for anything. But one of his polite criticisms was he's, when he listens to these podcasts, he's like, Jacob, I have no idea how old some of these people are. If I don't look at their picture, I don't know if they're your age or my age. Oh, yeah. He said, so when you're talking to them about where they're from, maybe get some years and some, some basis thrown in there so I know you know, what kind of music they might have listened to or whatever. Or what Mr. Stiefel, I was born in 1981. Currently 36 for yeah. people that can't do math as quickly. <laughs> there you go. What was the first CD that you purchased on your own accord? Um, it was not a CD. It was a cassette tape and uh, two gems from my childhood. Uh, Garth's first record. Okay. And the New Kids on the Block's first record. Oh, wow, look at him. We were going on a family road trip to Buffalo, New York, and solid Walmart had just shown up in Van Wert, Ohio. Yeah. And I got to pick out two cassettes, and those were it. <laughs> that was it. But the yeah. first CDs that I – I think I got them for Christmas uh, was Marky Mark and the Funky Bunch, and my mom got me uh, Meatloaf, Bad Out of Hell 2. Mm. Yours are much cooler than mine. My, my first, <laughs> The first one I bought was Chumba Wumba. Oh, wow. <laughs> How old are you? I am 30. Okay. Yeah. So I had was, the Chumba Wumba. <clears throat> I was like, I don't know, probably around 13 or so okay. when that was, because that was around 2000-ish, wasn't it? It's probably somewhere several years that. after that when you realized what you were actually listening to as uh, far as the content of that song. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. 
I had no idea. It just sounded cool. I get knocked down. Yeah. yeah. But I get up again. Yeah. You're never going to keep me down. <laughs> um, <laughs> My daughter's over there laying on the couch. We've got a guest in here. I think she might have fallen asleep watching I hope, YouTube. I hope so. She has headphones on, right? Mm-hmm. Okay. I was just wondering if I could say asshole and stuff, and and she wouldn't know. Yeah, she's heard it all. Well, wow. <laughs> yep. Cassidy stubbed his toe this morning and said every cuss word in the book. I just made that up. There's still some that I don't know, but that's impossible. Where were we? Where were we? Band. When? So when did you start playing music? Um, I was in my first. Well, I started playing music when I was little yeah uh, I had a musical uh, family uh yeah my mom played uh drums in, through college okay and my dad's always been like a huge country and classic rock fan so were you like the kid that was always banging on yeah like pots, pots and, and pans, pans until, you said, and when drums were your first yeah i still right? i still claim yeah. to be a drummer steve yeah. missamore <laughs> very cool <clears throat> so when did when did you did you would drum set come first like as far as actual yeah. instrument yeah i was in uh eighth grade and we had taken a high school marching band trip i was gonna be in high school the next year and uh so we were coming back from marching band camp that summer and the band director he knew that i had played guitar and he asked me if i played bass and i didn't know the first thing about bass whatsoever yeah and i was like sure i'll jump in you know i didn't know what i was doing at the time but i come to find out just like kind of say yes to anything and figure out how to do it say yes until you can't say yes anymore yeah yeah yeah. for sure get yourself into any situation you can so that was just kind of dumb luck that i kind of said yes to that yeah but uh there was a uh i think it was a dixon brand jazz bass that they had in the the closet it was from the 70s yeah and then there was a trainer pa like the the pa head and two like 410 or 412 cabs and uh so i ended up playing bass in in the pep band for basketball games oh that's cool boom 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 I wish they had a bass player at the. I don't even think we had a band at our basketball games. How big was your high school? Um, I mean, I graduated with like 150 people or something mm-hmm. like that. Uh, so I guess it was roughly between five and 700 kids at the high school. Okay. Something like that. We were, I think we were, at that point, I think we were 5A out of six classifications in the state of Alabama. So not huge, but we were the bigger. In the county, we were the biggest okay. city in the county. I think we had uh, sixty-eight kids graduate in ninety-nine. Yeah, and then like the whole Crestview school system, K through twelve, was like a thousand kids or something like that. Mm. Little, that's a and, small school. Yeah, like one and stop. You had, and you had a band at the at the basketball game. Yeah, we're just slacking, I guess. Come on, Fort Payne. They <laughs> might have one now. I don't know. I want to say towards the end of high school, they might have brought one in, but I digress. Um, you were playing in the, the, the high school thing. When did you start playing bands like with uh, with other kids uh, in, in garages and in '94? Um, I think. Who this was was what was your first band's name again? Midnight Desperados. Yeah, yeah. that's it. Man, I want a shirt. I want a Midnight Desperado shirt. I'd, uh, there there might still be Midnight Desperado shirts. If there's a large, it's got my name on it. I bet. I bet on some of the VHS I have stashed in the attic that there's. <laughs> Some video of that, yeah. But, but I was playing lead guitar, which is not a thing, <laughs> and Noodling that had to, that had to have been so terrible. But <clears throat> it's learning experience. Oh yeah, definitely. Um, and soon after that, there was a a band that played around Fort Wayne, Indiana, that scooped me up, and I started playing drums. That's still my first instrument. Yeah, back the, even back then, and. uh and they were all like thirty to fifty years old at the time, and just I mean, and you were what? bless their hearts. 16, I was like, four, oh. I was like fourteen, and they like having to get your mom to like drop you off at the mm-hmm. gigs. Yeah, and stuff. my mom took me to every gig. <laughs> That's cool though. That's I don't know, what was. Let's see, at fourteen, I guess I was playing acoustic for my buddies at parties and, and whatever. But I, I might could finish a handful of songs. Otherwise, mm-hmm. it was just you know play a verse and chorus and like. People would stop paying attention and be like, all right, well, I'll just go on to another one. It's crazy to watch some of that. That Well, it's crazy to watch footage of yourself like from so long ago and like from what you know about the technicality or just yeah. what you're actually playing now. 
it's like look back and analyze yourself back then. Yeah. It's, it's kind of it's kind of trippy to be like, why would you approach it like that? But you don't know what you don't know. Yeah. You, you've. It's hmm. a good point. It's Eighteen hmm. years of finding the better way to do things. Yeah. 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 But maybe looking back on yourself, kind of when you didn't know what rules mm-hmm. you were breaking or not breaking, you might see like an like oh that is an easier way yeah. to do it or yeah, something. You're so much more free. Yeah. Hmm. Back then, very cool. interesting. Very yeah. Interesting. <clears throat> it's like hacking away at that ten thousand hour mark. Yeah, yeah. When you, it's it's so cool about <laughs> getting into something before you know like what rules you can, what things you can or can't do, because that's when a lot of times tricks or things are stumbled upon that you didn't know. Whereas if you learn all the rules and you've been doing something for a while, you think, Oh, I can't do that. That's not, does that make sense? Yeah. You're trying to, you're kind of stuck in that box. Yeah. 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 So when you, when you start something new, it's like you're, there is no box. You don't know anything about a box yet. So anything's Mm -hmm. a possibility. So especially at 13, anything's a possibility in life. People (laughs) you can do, you can do it. If you can imagine it, this is motivational, motivational time. Are we all good? Yeah, we're good. How you doing back there? Good? You want to say hey to the people? No? Okay. <laughs> all right, then. Man, I'm already almost out of coffee. Where were we? The Oh, the band with the older gentleman. Um, what kind of music were y'all playing? Um, it was like 50s rock and roll pop to like 90s country. Yeah. Like the, the best of the best 90s country, boot scoot and boogie. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And in the country best. What kind of stuff when you were, when you would go home and, and sit and jam either on guitar or bass or whatever in your room, what kind of stuff did you like to listen to and jam along with and learn just for your own? Uh, Steve Miller's greatest hits record. Uh, it's like the blue cover with the, like the orange Eagle yeah. head yeah, on yeah, it. Or whatever. Yeah, I had it. That like swing town, that, that bass intro always just like got me fired up. And I found a, uh, greatest hits CCR cassette. Mm hmm somewhere my dad had and I wore that thing out. Was that a was down on the corner on that? Yeah. Down on the corner. I think Suzy Q was studio. the first uh oh, guitar yeah. solo I ever learned. Yeah, yeah. Man, that was super good. basic but just like what a I remember <clears throat> sitting and working on there was a Jimmy Buffett album that I still listen to all the time to this day. It's a it's a live See what uh, what was the name of that? You had to be there, I think. The live Jimmy Buffett album, he did mm. half of it was at the Fox Theater in Atlanta, and other half was I think down in Florida or something. But in it, halfway through, he does an acoustic couple of songs, just him. I remember sitting and learning Grapefruit, Juicy Fruit, on just the way he was playing it. It was one of the first times I sat down and just completely listened and learned a song like all myself. I don't know how old I was, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, but like the whole thing. Um, I think I stood on the record. That's really hard. Is is learning a song on vinyl and then because like, you have to back it up. Yeah, you can see how to pick up the needle and go back. But once you on. once you've like sat down and learned a song on your own, like copying, yeah. and trying to play it like somebody else. Yeah. But once you've like accomplished that, whatever that means to you at the yeah. time, like your confidence level. Oh, and it like opens doors because because of the confidence, but also like. Just because you're now, you can now think, oh, I can do this. I want to learn another one. Yeah. You know, and then you learn one more and you're like, oh, and I you can get do this better again. at it. Yeah, for sure. Same way with like chart and songs. Like, you know, as a side guy for years and years, like, here's 12 songs we're going to play next weekend or tomorrow night. Yeah. Or in some cases, tonight. Yeah. <laughs> and so, like, you chart these songs and you, you know, I was very proud to come to a point where I didn't have to like have a guitar in my hand. I could chart a song and the numbers would be now explain to I, I understand what okay. you mean. Explain to people what when you say charting a song. Oh, so some uh, people might not know. Uh, the national number system is what it's called. Um how to explain that easily. Uh you're basically taking the notes of a song, A, B, C, D, E, F, G, sharps, flats, and all included, and turning it into numbers so that you could say the song is a one chord, four chord, five chord, which would be like A, D, E. Yeah. For music people that 
have any remote idea. Of yeah, we well, have numbers that correspond to whatever chord or note that you need to hit at yeah. that point in the song, and so you can go through the song, and on one page, sometimes two, you can write down, you know, verse or these numbers, chorus or these numbers, whatever, and then that way people can look back at the chart and then be able to play through the song, even if you just heard it a couple of times. Once you get used to like. Cassie was saying here, once you get used to making the charts and reading the charts, same thing. It's another way of notating music. Like, yeah. it's not sheet music, but it's a blank page with numbers written on it. Yeah. And that way you could also change the key because you had the same numbers written down, but you just move some frets around or yeah. however. Is he playing, playing some stuff for us back there? He's checking out. That's all right. Checking out the bridges on that's his Gibsons. What, that's what they're for. Just don't drop them. <laughs> So you were with the uh, what was the name of the band that um, you were in with the older with the older gentleman that ended up being called Generations. I so, say, so we went I midnight say older gentlemen, but they were like you know I mean, our they're, age. They're now. our age now, yeah. <laughs> but I was uh, writing some notes, yeah, yeah to prep yeah. myself last night, and I was like oldsters. I was like, wait a minute, I was like fourteen, fifteen, and they were my age now. Yeah, it's nuts, but, isn't it? Yeah, I told somebody I was describing. A person to someone the other day and i said oh he's got you know short to medium length hair he's a younger guy you know early 30s <laughs> i thought whoa i just referred yeah. to someone in their early 30s as young i was like oh no but we are yeah we, we are it's a day-to-day battle young and vibrant as long as i can get up and do my stretches <laughs> going to the gym every morning with she's been been out of school for the holiday stuff but school starts tomorrow Oh, school's it's back. back on. One of my favorite lines in a Christmas song is that uh, mom and dad can hardly wait for school to start it again. Because mm-hmm. I didn't get it when I was growing up. But like as soon as my sister had kids and I started, my buddies started having kids, I'm like, oh, I get that now. Yes. The band, you said it was called the Gener- or Generation? Yeah, Generations? so we were crushing the name game in uh, okay. Northwest Ohio. Um, Midnight Desperados, Popular Demand. Mm. Generations, man! I need to start a band and just get you to come name it. You Nailed can play. It. You could come play lead guitar, and I'll play drums. That is a recipe <laughs> for <laughs> disaster. Yeah, that's awful. I have a drum set in the closet at my mom and dad's house. One day I'll have a place to set it up, and then I could relearn how to play drums. <laughs> I played. <clears throat> I had a really really crappy set of drums in like sixth grade. I didn't even have a hi hat. I just just rode the crash. Just yeah, I mean it's get, getting getting it under your hands, yeah. getting it under your muscles. I would go out there. One time, I got uh, sent home from school because I had an ACDC shirt on that had some lyrics on the back of the shirt, and the lyrics were "Born with a stiff dot 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 stiff upper lip." Huh. I was in sixth grade. I didn't even understand what the, the the innuendo, what the hinting was for. I was just like, it's ACD, it's a song, come on. But they sent me home from school, so I was so mad. I went out there and just played drums for like three hours. But they, just, so they ah. sent you home from school, out yeah. of school, yeah. as opposed to just turning your shirt on, or turning your shirt inside out? Let's see. Okay, no. Or were there extenuating circumstances before that? No, what it was was, <laughs> it was at, uh, we've got a little monkey in the, in the yeah. studio here, bouncing around. It's all good. Oh yeah, we're good. Um, it was at a school dance, a junior high dance that I went to, and I had the shirt on. And they asked me to either turn inside out or go home, and I was like, "Go home." Oh, so, so you had the option. Okay. The next day, that makes a little bit more sense. I, <laughs> the next day, I got up and and wore it to school, that same shirt. And I just put duct tape over the words on the back of it, um, but I think it just said like born with a and then duct tape over it or something like that but the vice principal who saw it the night before saw me walk in with that on and immediately called me into the office and told me to turn it inside out i was just a rebel just a rebel at seventh grade my i think it was seventh grade for me as well my aunt for my birthday had gotten me this t-shirt and there was a big mushroom on it with an alien, it's probably from Hot Topic or Spitzer's <laughs> Kiss, but there's an alien like chilling out, obviously stoned now to, yeah. to my eye now. Right. But then I'm like, oh, cool, it's an alien and a mushroom, oh. whatever. <laughs> I put it on and I get called to the principal's office yeah. and 
standing in front of her desk and she's like, you have to turn your shirt inside out. And I'm like, why? She's like, because it stands for marijuana. (laughs) And I was like, what? I had no idea what that even was. It was marijuana. What? (laughs) Then the next day after I wore the ACDC shirt again, the next day I went home and I was like, what other risque shirts do I have? So then I wore the next day I wore a Hooters shirt <clears throat> that said on the back of it had a girl in football pants standing there. And it said, you'll always be the favorite when you've got a tight end. <laughs> got in trouble for that, too. But at that like point, pushing they were just all watching. the buttons. Yeah, well, that's, I think that was the extent of my rebellious days. What? Enough about me, ladies and gentlemen. You don't want to hear about me. You want to hear about Trevor Travis. I mean, uh, uh, Cassidy Feesby here. We're gonna, we both looked up at the Trevor Travis picture again. Yeah. This is great. I got to put that. That might be the episode picture for. Okay. <laughs> I don't know. We'll see. We'll see about it. What uh, What came after generation? Is it generation or generations? Generations, because I Plural. was the the you young the buck young. of the group, and okay. then spanned many generations. So when I, did you? So you were fourteen, fifteen. What did you do after high school? Um, I wor- worked in the factory with with my parents for three months just to save some extra money for mm-hmm. college and then moved straight to Nashville and went to Belmont. Ooh, fancy, fancy pants. It's the only, co- uh, the only college I applied to and really? the only one that said yes. Well, there you go. Funny how that 100%. Works. Yes. Yeah. Well, so when you started, what was that, 2000? Uh, 99. 99? Yeah. Cool. Did you, what did you study? At I was uh, studied commercial percussion, dr- basically drum set. Um, I got to take lessons with Chester Thompson of Phil Collins and – uh, Oh my god, John a blank. It happens. Uh, Phil Rudd. No, uh, no, no. Phil. Rudd. He, he played for uh, Genesis. God. Genesis and Phil Collins. He Chester played. Okay. For, oh, I see. What you're for, oh yeah. I uh, wasn't. Wasn't Phil Rudd? Wasn't that the name of ACDC drummer? He, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. He just it's got in trouble for time. like yeah, killing somebody no, or he, kid stuff. Allegedly. Or, like bought a contract for somebody to kill somebody or something. Oh, I, don't, yeah. I don't want to hear about any of that. He was a great drummer. That's all I want to remember. Yeah. I don't even know. Is he, is he still alive? He's probably in prison. I, don't I know. think he's in prison. Oh, uh, well, it's probably a good place for him, I guess. He's doing well. He's doing well in prison. <laughs> the best drummer in that prison. <laughs> <laughs> when did you, when you came up here, I guess go back to, at what point did you know that music was what you want to do with your life? How early was that? Um, was there a define a definite moment where you were like, okay, this isn't just something I like to do. This is what I want to do with my life. I, I don't think there was like a defining moment, but yeah. like this was in the heyday of like nineties country. Like Garth was huge. Yeah. And so I was like, I don't even know what it is or what it was about yeah. it. But I mean, it, it's, Lar- it's such a large industry yeah. now for a reason, but that's what kind of kickstarted what it became today. But it, it just grabbed a hold of me, and I'm sure it, at by the time I had to like make a choice of what I wanted to do after high school, so like seventh eighth grade, like I mean, you're there. I was already being primed to like figure out, you know, boy, yeah. you're, boy, you're gonna go to college. <clears throat> you gotta start like, making choices. Yeah. You gonna be a a doctor or a lawyer? Because that's or engineer. Yeah. <laughs> um. And luckily, like if I would have decided to ride dirt bikes, my parents were supportive of that. Yeah. And then, but you know, it, it was music and very cool. And when I'm, you when you got up here and you're in school, did you? When did you start? Also, like playing gigs and looking for gigs as a musician. Um, it was probably two years after I had moved to Nashville before I like discovered Broadway and started, you know, quote unquote networking, networking, and, yeah, and meeting people and doing other band stuff. Um, did you, is that something you consciously went out and did, or was it just kind of like you were just making friends? And um, it I'd, into I'd, networking? I'd made some friends and they played on Broadway and they're like, Hey, come down and, you know, check out the scene. Cool. But, uh, like in the, the two years that I, uh, like moved here in 99 and then a mutual friend got me this, uh, job being like a personal assistant in an administrative, um, work at this publishing company. So I kind of like had my hands in that and yeah that's a cool door that some people use or whatever to get in is, is doing like the whole consistent thing you never know like yeah. who or what situation is going to come along 
and yeah. lead to something else. For sure. Um, like we said earlier, say yes until you yeah. can't say yes anymore. And yeah. I filled in some gaps uh, with Bradfield stage lighting, like setting up either like stages <clears throat> or like private parties. Yeah. But like on the tech crew side of things. Mm-hmm. Um, Just getting stuff, you know, doing doing what you can when you can yeah. and remembering and people. My first my first Nashville band was Stoic Oak with uh, Sarah Buxton, Jeff Crow. Man, if I ever start a band, I'm going to get you to think of a band name for me. You got some good ones. Stoic with a K, S-T-O-I-K. Of course. Um, and that was kind of like Almond Brothers meets Fleetwood Mac with two drummers, <laughs> keys, bass, guitar. Sarah Buxton is a singer. That sounds. Those were good times. Yeah, sounds pretty good. Did you? So did you want at that point? Did you want to be in a band, like, and have that be like a full time thing, and all of you share the? I think at that point I was I still had like blinders on, like living in the present. Like this is, yeah, I'm committing to this, and that's that's what we're doing right now. Yeah, take it as far as it can go. Right, and then it wasn't till after that that I like I started going down on Broadway with people. Yeah, did you start? Uh, when you were playing, when you started Broadway gigs, were you doing drums, bass, both? Um, that was drums for maybe, I don't know, maybe like a year. Yeah. And and I had a bass and a bass amp in my dorm in college or yeah. like whatever. So this was like now. 99 to 03? Yeah. Era-ish? And uh, I just got done with a shift playing drums and somebody's bass player had bailed. And they're like, we need a ba- bass player now. I was like, yeah. I've got the gear and went down and it's, it was you know all country tunes and yeah. went down and they're like okay you want to go do this other gig and so after after a time it would be like 6 months of drum nothing but drum gigs 6 months of nothing but bass gigs this is all me hashing this out now looking back right looking back and, yeah and just like the, I don't know, the stars aligned to where i was getting both sides of the rhythm section 6 months at a time Good experience from both of them that's yeah. great it's a uh, it's so good for your mind on both sides of that. So, because when you're playing drums, you can be thinking like a drummer, but also thinking like a bass player, yeah. and vice versa. Like looking down yeah. on it, big picture stuff. Yeah, for sure. The question that uh, <clears throat> that I would have wanted to know had had I, if I were a young musician listening to this right now, is how does a man go from playing drums and bass on Broadway? you know, not long after moving to town to playing bass for Dirk Smitley. This, that, that cliche of like networking, yeah, which even comes into the way I, or not the way I met my wife, but like my wife and I had been together for six years and, uh, she was nannying. My wife was nannying for different people. Yeah. And, uh, through the grapevine had become Dirk's and his wife Cassidy's nanny. And I was tour managing and playing bass for this other artist. And my wife was too pregnant with our daughter to, uh, like, do that gig anymore. Yeah. And right in about that same two-week period that she had to quit is when the bass player and guitar player of Dirk's band left. And I was just within that two degrees of separation. Man. And, they're like, and actually, Cass had texted my wife and said... Does Cassidy want to audition? It's like Cass was Cass Dirk's is Dirk's wife. wife. Yeah. Okay, she's Cass. I'm Cassidy. Whenever gotcha. we're like in the same room, it's not uh, confusing at all. No, <laughs> never. Um, they're like, does Cassidy want to audition? It's like, are you kidding me right now? Of course. Oh, I guess so. <laughs> and I had yeah, done no, I had done like two or three auditions with other artists. Yeah, and you know, if you ever had the opportunity to audition for anybody, go do it. Yeah, even whether if, you if, even if you don't want the gig yeah. for what, whatever that even means. Like, go do it for the experience. It's just like a, I mean, it's a job interview. Yeah. Just another word for a job interview. Yeah. And anytime you can do a job interview, you should go do it for mm-hmm. the experience. Because I never even thought of do, it. You're, you're, more, you're more prepared for the next time. You're more confident. You're more, you know, whatever. For Ready for any questions that somebody might ask you. Or, I never even thought about comparing that to, like, you know, real job interviews. Yeah. But it, it's it is a real job interview. Just that's what it is. Yeah. It's own kind of job so, for sure. Yeah. I compare uh, booking shows like that I, that I book for myself. To me, it's very similar to when I graduated from college and came up here and started looking for engineering jobs before I started playing music full time. Uh, 
I carried resumes around and, you know, filled out applications online and <clears throat> knowing good and well that most of them were not even going to get looked at. Did you have business cards? Uh, I feel certain that I, that I had some made. I, I found my resume the other day. I was laughing about it. But but I, I compare that to attempting to book shows because it's the same thing. Like you send out, I send out emails to clubs and venues and booking people and promoters knowing <laughs> knowing that most of them are probably just going to get mm-hmm. you know filtered out because they probably get 30 to 40 emails a day from people trying to book shows yeah. but so, you have to cast that big net we got to do it because out of so many emails that you send or resumes that you put out and you know send out all it takes is one for somebody to say yes oh we got music <laughs> Um, but then, but the thing is with booking shows, it's like sending out a resume and you, if you get that job, that's one night and you gotta, it's like, you gotta keep, keep doing it. So, but I digress about shows booking, but you get that one show and then the opportunities that would possibly come out of that for sure. And I've also found, uh, I bet you about it, but I've also found that, uh, it's kind of like fishing. Now I compare it more to fishing than job applications because I kind of have my lures and I know the emails that I want to send out. And then it's just kind of like just casting them out, cast it out. And then, Oh, got a bite. Oh, lost it. Yeah. Well, and you've probably over the years honed in the way that you word things. Oh yeah. And if you actually get somebody on the phone or. Yeah. I found this people listening. If you're, if you're trying to book your own shows, brief, very short, brief, bulleted point emails are what people want to read because like I said they've, they're probably getting 20 emails a day at least about somebody wanting to play at their bar and so <clears throat> when I first started I would send a long email explaining who I was a little short bio like all these things they don't give a shit about that they don't care they want to they want to know what dates you're looking for what kind of music you play and a couple of links to live video of you playing. That's probably even compounded. That's it. It's compounded even more now with like, like the Facebook mindset of like, you have 30 seconds to yeah. get your point across to somebody in a video or else. Yeah, for sure. They're going to yeah. go and look at something else in ADD. Yeah. I usually in like the, the subject of the email, I put booking my name, the date. And then the email is like five lines long. Like here, I'm a touring artist rounding through. Uh, do you have any of these dates available? Here's some links to check out. Thanks. Mm-hmm. That's it. And that's where I've got the most success out of. So if any, if that helps any of you out there, I'll take 5%. You can. Uh, <laughs> I mean, that tells the club owner or booker or whoever that you've got your shit together too. It's like here, there's, yeah. there's no extra crap in here. For sure. Yeah, that's a good point. So you got uh, your, your, your playing base for Dirks. You get that. You go in for the, tell us about the, the tryout. You get that. So I got to, I got the text slash call on a Thursday, and the auditions were on a Monday, and there were four songs, and they threw like a kind of a bluegrass song into the last minute on upright. He's a big bluegrass fan, ain't he? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. That's y'all. Do, y'all still do a lot of stuff with the Dale McCurry crew or Dale McCurry and his band or something? Didn't he do? Um, didn't he do a lot with them there for a while? Yeah, I'll, I think the the McCurries played on. Uh, two maybe three of the songs on the ridge record um but yeah we, we see those guys often enough not yeah. as, um what was the question no, no, no um what were we talking about the uh the inter- oh, the, the, the audition the audition yeah what songs um, I, inter- I interrupted you uh, i do that from time to time um the first song was trying to stop you leaving which is still one of my favorite dirk songs um and i think that the record before they were just coming off the Feel That Fire tour. And so we didn't feel that fire. Um, feel fire. Maybe uh, Every Mile of Memory. Ooh, I like that one. That was a good one. And then the, the the grass song we did was Train Traveling. What was the first one you said? The Trying to Stop You Leaving. I think that's, that's, that video is really sexy, hmm. if I remember correctly. Aw, uh, ads. Oh, give us that ad. <clears throat> anyway. I uh, I assume the audition went well. Yeah. Um, so like it was you know Monday at four, forty five minute audition or whatever. And as I'm driving from Soundcheck here in Nashville, the rehearsal studios, 
um, home, Dirks calls me and we probably talked for 30 minutes and I'm trying to listen to his voice. Like if it's, if he's going to say yes or no. Yeah. And hindsight again, it's like, why would he, why would anybody waste their time talking to you for 30 minutes that they're going to give you a no? Right. Unless they're like really, really just overly nice and can't, <laughs> yeah. can't say no. At the, Did you, were you thinking at this point that like this could be life changing or are you just thinking, well, I'm going to go in here and, and do what I can and see what happens. Does that make sense? Yeah. Like, did you know how big, cause I mean, looking back, that was a pivotal moment for me. Yeah. Yeah. And your, your professional life just from, from having done the really <clears throat> few auditions that I had done, I just went in and it's like the worst that's going to happen is they say no. Yeah. And I'll be in the exact same spot that I'm at. And yeah, for but sure. That's not, not yeah. how it turned out. There you go. Thankfully. Even, even better. Yeah. Yeah. Well, did he, uh, did he like give you a hug and say you're in or did you, like, high five? Well, or? He said, uh, if you'd like to join us in the band, we'd love to have you. And I'm like, are you kidding me? Of course. <clears throat> yes. He's like, I plan on touring until I'm 60. So awesome. I'll jump on. At, at least he didn't do like a cowboy Eddie long. That was still guitar player for Hank jr. For years when he played his first show with Hank, they called him backstage after the show and said, you did a great job. Cowboy. You got one more thing to do before you're a part of the crew. Here's a fifth of Jack Daniels. You got to turn it up and and kill it. Jeez. So he had to, he had to <clears throat> open and chug a full bottle of Jack Daniels, and he did it. <laughs> he said he uh, commits to throwing up for hours. Well, but, yeah. Ugh. So at least you didn't have to do that. Yeah. I, I, part of me would say that that's a different time. Oh yeah. Which it is, but I'm sure there's some crew out there that would still pull that. Probably. I don't know. That's mighty brutal. I don't know them. That was that was like around 1980 or so, sometime in there, when Cowboy started with Hank and them. He said it was. He said at one point he was drinking like 30 beers a day. 30. I've seen that happen. Not I've Oof. not not ever done that, but no. I've seen seen that happen. Even in my beer drinking heyday in college, I don't think I ever. I don't think I ever got to like full case status. I think I just can't. I assume that's, that's I'm, like I'm a, not a big beer drinker because I don't like drinking more than 10 of anything. I don't really like drinking more than six of anything. I would get so tired by then in the first place. That ugh, seems like a lot of work. Way down. Like <laughs> pick up a case of beer and hold that in your hand. And then think all that liquid inside of you. You're putting, you know, and you're putting that into your body too. Yeah. yeah. Oof. Oof. I'm just going to drink some coffee and try not to think about that feeling. Mm. So you're now you're with Dirks. You are the bass player. When was that? What year? Oh, that was 2010. 2010. What, uh, did y'all just take off on a tour at the end? Or um, that was like right at the same time that the Ridge record came out. And yeah. So I had like three months of like, kind of like I stayed with, uh, Jason Jones was the, artist I was with before I stayed with him and just kind of like phased out and yeah. got a, a tour manager and helped him and bass player replace in, in your, place. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> like a good responsible person. Would yes. do. That's another thing. Yeah. Uh, and that's the first thing on my resume under my name. Good responsible. There you go. <laughs> uh, when did, did y'all do have to do a lot of like rehearsing, I guess when you first started with um, Dirks? Bef- bef- every year before we go on like out for a tour, we'll do yeah. like, two or three weeks of like band rehearsal and then a production rehearsal and then put everything together Yeah, for a, like that for last week. Show. In. Is it <clears throat> his shows? Are they pretty like, not that this is a bad thing, but are they pretty planned out and choreographed out from like one song to the next yeah. to the next and like you always kind of do it the same way. Yeah. And now it's a little bit more like that now just because it's a bigger production and yeah. there's more people involved. And so it has to be more on point. Yeah. But there's, there's times like there might be one weekend where everything goes as it's supposed to. Right. Air and, quotes. Yeah. yeah. And then other times like, you know, something might happen and we go off the grid or. Does he ever so just say, Hey, loose. let's do this song and just throw yeah, in one yeah, that's that, that'll, cuff, that'll still right? happen. It's yeah. like, Hey, like he might hear something during the day and be like, Hey, let's, uh, let's do this. Yeah. And so, you know, that's what we've all been programmed to right. do is like fire off the cuff. And, yeah. and like when I first came in, like the, some shows are like super loose. Like we all come from, you know, you, you make it happen. 
you make the show happen no right. matter what it takes. Yeah, that's the number one thing. Yeah, for sure. I uh, <clears throat> I was watching a Leonard Skinner documentary the other day on the Axis Channel, whatever the AXS, AXS whatever. Yeah. yeah, and I hadn't seen this particular one before, and they were talking. About, I didn't know this, but apparently, all of Skinner's songs were completely like the solos and everything were completely choreographed like it was always the same solo like alan collins could sit down and play you his freebird solo and then sit down and play it the exact same way again and then sit down and play it the exact same way they're like signature yeah like the entire solos every like, gary rossington lick and like everything they had it like because ronnie van zant was a stickler about wanting it to be the same way every time well there's, there's like something to that because like i correlate i correlate pretty much everything into 80s and 90s country but <laughs> yeah. there's like like all those skinner guitar solos yeah Maybe some less than others, but or more than others, but you can sing them. They're in your head. They're mm-hmm. signature licks. Same thing with like, you know, early Brooks and Dunn guitar solos. Yeah, there was a, there's there's a couple of there's a couple of Brooks and Dunn songs that have piano solos that I'm pretty sure are the exact same piano solo, just in like the different key for the song. Mm-hmm. I forgot what it is. It's a I don't remember. I mean, anyway, it might have yeah. been like the same same people. Like oh, probably so. On yeah, that too. Yeah. Um, huh. What was I going to say? But here we are. I was say something. Here we are. I'm almost through. Almost through coffee cup number two. January. How 3rd. you doing out there, people listening? Uh, it's like you're sitting right here with us. And I got. Did you see my picture, of Elvis? I put up there. I did. I saw. There's another one. There's another one over there. Over there got, with cans on. Yeah. Yeah. Two pictures of Elvis. I want to get those blown up, but they're really shitty quality. So I had to just print them off at small things but there's there are two pictures of elvis and in each of them he's wearing headphones and talking into broadcast microphones so it's like you know elvis radio tour <clears throat> we're joined by the king in here in all conversations what are some of your favorite memories of being out with dirks some cool things some shitty things you know oh man tell us about uh, it to the to talk to the you know, 18, 19, 20 year old Cassidy that's just moved to town or the you know, oh. the young Jacob that's just moved to town. What's some, some cool stories or things you should or shouldn't do on the road? Um, you might have to edit this time out. Uh, I'm talking like for, what's the first time like y'all played the, you played the, the Opry or something, something cool like that. Uh, the first time I played the Ryman yeah. was really cool. Uh, it's like, Sam Bush, Del McCurry, Marty Stewart, Allison Ooh. Krause. We did like 12 songs. Man. And like we had like rehearsed. It was, I think I only played two songs on electric bass and all the rest was upright. And I'm not Ooh. an upright player. I was about to, I was about to I, ask, I is that one, something that I, you... I can you... do that, but I'm not that. Yeah. Um, That's a whole nother game. But the, the what I remember <clears throat> about that is in the uh, stage left, it's like the second dressing room stage left. We were doing like vocal rehearsal and like everybody had their instruments, just acoustic playing together. Oh. And we're on a circle <clears throat> facing each other. And I'm like just looking at these faces around and we're all singing together. Yeah. It's like, what is this? It's like bookmark that moment. Yeah. Because, yeah, for sure. It's one moment of like if the 18 year old me could open a little 10 by 10 wooden door and look through it and like, hey, in what, 10, 12 years from now, here's five seconds of what you're going to be doing. It's like, yeah. That would fuel the fire yeah. for yeah, yeah for years. That's what it's cool. One of the biggest things that I've gotten out of people in these conversations is uh, at the end I'll ask like, what would you tell yourself at eighteen, nineteen years old? And so many people give some form of just keep going, just just don't give up, keep yeah. trying because it'll work out. Just don't stop. You know, I've never been like a, a person that talks a lot. Yeah, that's why. Like coming into this interview, I'm like, uh, "What am I going to talk about?" But like, I've found maybe that it, it's it's better to like be quiet and just take everything in, which is like a kind of an analogy to being the the worst player in the room. It's like when I first started going on to Broadway, yeah. I was terrible, but. I like listen to all these amazing players and you're just like soaking it up and learning points and just taking yeah. it all in and bettering yourself. 
Yeah. And always, uh, what, like, what do they say? Always surround yourself with people that are better than you. Yeah. So you'll rise to their And level. just sign on <clears throat> in your mind to just, you're going to be a lifelong learner. Yeah. Even when, like when you hit roadblocks and like you might have a bad day or a bad month of yeah. whatever's going on in your life. It's like, just, just keep, keep trucking through and yeah. Chance pro- and I were talking the other day and like, we kind of wish we could go to college now. Like at 30 years old, I feel like I would be a great college student because I, I would go and be interested in learning these things mm-hmm. and, and trying instead of sleeping during class yeah. and trying to get out of work. It's because you're like, not a kid anymore. Well, yeah. yeah. I suppose so. My back would agree with you, sir. Uh, uh, what's I, some- I also never want to be 21 years old again. It was fun one time Man, around. One of my favorite um, memes is uh, some cartoon picture, but it, it says, so I'm 30 now, but I still feel like I'm 20 until I'm around 20 year olds. And then mm-hmm. I'm like, no, never mind. I'm 30. Yeah. I'm like, That's yeah. so true. What's she going? What's she going back there? What's up? Well, she got her headphones on. What, uh, what are some other cool Dirk stories for the peoples? Um, anything? Being in some of these, uh, I think I've, I've been in like <clears throat> 10 music videos and one of them, uh, the, the first one that was silly was the drunk on a plane video. I'm like the, the male steward that is come in between or the male flight attendant that that's come in between, uh, this, uh, man and woman on this plane, on this airline flight. And then, uh, once Wes Edwards, the director knew that I would, I have no shame and would probably do anything. Yeah. Um, for the somewhere on a beach video, he's like, we've got your outfit all picked out Just show up. And I, I get to the set and there's five basically thongs. One's like the tall Borat man thong. Oh no. And, Cause I was, I was the lifeguard in that video. And, uh, but in the beach video, I'm going to pull all I, these up. These will all be on the, uh, the show notes page, which my, is don't stifle me.com slash zero four two. Sorry, go ahead. Might have got in over my head on the not wearing clothes on a national TV setting. <laughs> We're going to, I've never seen this one. Oh, you're in for a real treat. We'll just leave it playing. You can tell me when it gets there. <clears throat> Being a music video, look at you all it's, the way from. It's uh, another one of those things. Like you open that little door. It's like, you're going to be able to do this. You like, you are going to get to do this, but Podunk, Ohio, but you, the- you can't, you can't know that. Oh yeah. You're not allowed to know that. Yeah, because then it would uh, take the the it, mystery out yeah, of it. Yeah, it, it takes the, like the, your entire experience and that journey is not it like disqualifies it. Yeah, yeah, you can't. What's well, that's like on the other spectrum? It's like knowing when and where you're going to die. Like, yeah, you don't want to know that. Yeah, because that would take the mm-hmm. the experience and life out of it. Because you're supposed to land there, not knowing. Yeah, when uh, on the when you're on the road, do y'all do? Did y'all ever do like pranks on each other? Anything I've seen, or on the like opening acts, or anybody you're on there, tour? There were with? a couple I've, years that uh, bands <clears throat> were doing pranks on each other, um, like filling. I don't know. We bought like 24 cases of Bud Light and filled somebody's bus up with it, like put it in their air vents, and then tied floss all around so you like you couldn't even walk through the bus. There was so much <laughs> floss in it, which is a, like a huge pain in the ass. Like I wouldn't <laughs> want to have that done to us. But I think Dirks was at the helm on starting all those pranks. And yeah. so like all, all the retribution was directly back at him, like wrapping his truck in saran wrap. Or I think Kip Moore uh, wrote all over D's truck with some sort of car paint and yeah. then put a goat in the back of it. Just silly stuff. Nothing, nothing legit what, harmful. What uh, do you have other goals life in life as, you know, beyond – Playing, are you just going to kind of like stay with Dirks until Dirks is no longer doing Dirks? Yeah, for right right now. Yeah, Yeah. I don't know if you had ultimate plans of opening a theme park. My ultimate plan is like to like you know to be a songwriter, which is like a huge open door of like yeah. Um, so you know it's a work in progress on that front. Um, I'm like a DIY DIY home repair guy. Yeah, love mowing the yard. Love being home. What, is, uh, what does your home. wife do? Uh, she is the public <clears throat> programs coordinator at the Country Music Hall of Fame. That sounds fancy. It's uh, so do you get to go to events and be her arm candy? Um, I'm amazing arm candy, by the <laughs> way. 
Um, I've been to several events down there. Um, and if you've not been to the Country Music Hall of Fame and Museum, definitely go because they oh, have yeah. really, really cool stuff down there. The events. And it's such the, a – it's all like intertwined and connected to the, the Hall of Fame. And mm-hmm. there's like the hat show print thing that's right yeah. there. And it's all attached to the Omni Hotel. And there's a couple of nice restaurants and hall – and of course, it's smack in downtown yeah. Nashville around everything. So. It's like people used to like when they would come to town. Like, what should we do? And it's like, well, you have to go see the Broadway stuff. Like, I live in East Nashville. Like, the restaurants all over yeah. Nashville are, are like killing it right now. Yeah. But like, your first or second stop needs to be the Hall of Fame because that yeah. kind of like puts the whole, you know, late eighteen hundreds to present into yeah. perspective. Because then you can go through the rest of the city and have a basis for, oh, I saw this in the Hall of Fame. This is that building, or this mm-hmm. is where so-and-so did this, or whatever. But, yeah, that's a good point. I the, the, about that. Like, being two degrees <clears throat> of se- two degrees separated from the Hall of Fame for the past couple months um, has put it into perspective for me. Like, the Hall of Fame, like, you know, say, Ferland Husky and Ernest Hub, like, they, the Hall of Fame's looking at it from, or the Hall of Fame Museum, are looking at country music from like the big picture as a whole, like the impact that Ernest Hub had on the music and the industry. Same thing with like FGL and, yeah. and Dirks. So like somebody might come to town and they only like new country and they hate old stuff. But it's like I don't know. It's it's well, yeah. It it's makes the you entire look history at, of it all plays together. Yeah, and we're if here you now. Care about. Any phase of country music, whether it's 90s country or modern stuff now or 60s, whatever, Mm -hmm. if you really do care about that, then you should care like what affected, what created that and what that helped create because it's all intertwined. I mean, that's asking led to the next and led to the next. And it's asking the folks out there to like go back and give it some try at like learning the history, not learning everything, but like go back with an open mind and like listen to stuff yeah. because like it all plays into the next generation and it's mm-hmm. brought us to where we are today. Very good point. Very good point. So Cassidy, if you could go back and tell yourself something at 18, 19 years old, when you started Belmont, you're fresh, fresh on the Nashville scene. It's 1999. It's a, you know, that's, it's the, what do they call it? The new year's Eve that, the Y2K. Y2K. It's Y2K. Oh, you don't I know if you're about... going to make it through the end of the year yeah. or not. This might would... all be for nothing. <laughs> what would you tell yourself? Advice. Keep that bright, shiny attitude. Yeah. Just, just I mean, always just keep progressing and come into situations with a smile on your face and like, like just be happy, be present. Yeah. Cool. Dig it. Don't have to be anything fancy. You can put yeah. that. You can put that on a bumper sticker, ladies and gentlemen. Just be present. I'm going to make a billboard sometime that says "just just don't be an asshole." Just um, or maybe a shirt. That, maybe you can put that on a t-shirt. I'm going to get that so tattooed. That, yeah, it's going to be right? permanent. Yeah, that's it. Just be cool. Be cool. Be present. Don't be an asshole. Uh, thanks for listening, everybody. Thanks, Cassidy, for coming in and talking. Thanks, brother Jacob. Yeah, man. Cassidy Fees B, thank you for coming in, and thank you to you people listening for not going away. Good stuff. Check out uh, check out Dirks.com that is D-I-E-R-K-S dot com for tour dates so you can go see Cassidy plucking the bass guitar and all the other fellas in the band. And if you want to check out Cassidy on Twitter, he is at Dr. Feesby. That is D R F E A S B Y. And on Instagram, he is at Cap Chet. I don't know. At C A P T C H E T. Um, there will be a link to all of that and more over at don'tstifleme.com slash 042, because this was episode 42. Boom. And I'll put a few of the music videos of Dirks Bentley's that Cassidy is in, and maybe a live video or something over at the show notes page also. I Like I said earlier, I recommend the Somewhere on the Beach video that Cassidy does the Baywatch slow-mo run down the beach. And like I said if you at the start here, if you enjoyed this talk, then most importantly, subscribe. If you'd like to review the podcast, then that would be a, a beautiful thing for you to do. Share, you know, 
spread the word, help us get it out there. But also, if you want more, maybe some behind-the-scenes stuff that nobody else has access to, well, then you should go check out www.patreon.com slash dsmpodcast. And that, you get some pictures and videos and stuff that other people can't see and don't get a chance to check out. But it also helps me, the little bit of a month helps me be able to keep doing these episodes and stuff because you know it takes time and effort and all kinds of stuff to set up these interviews and edit the stuff and what i'm doing right now and all that you know i enjoy doing it but help keeps the 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 train moving forward so the podcast social medias if you are interested are all at dsm podcast on twitter and instagram and mine are all at jacob stiefel and i run everything so say hey comment whatever you want to do uh that does it for today ladies and gentlemen you are the best i love you all i'll talk to you again real soon what do you think chance Sounds really good. Oh, what